Hello, hello. There. And I'm actually facing the right way too. That's fun. Um, welcome to today's Games Masters chat. And I have a couple things written down to possibly talk about. Um, but if there's any questions, feel free to drop it in there. And I will do my best to answer them. I don't really need this unless someone decides to jump in with straight in the streaming space with me. Um, one of the things actually I, I, I want to talk about um, and something I'm quite passionate about is the importance of role-playing games on people. Because a lot of people think that they, they go into thinking, oh, I'm going to play d and I want to give it a try. Or you try to talk to your friends about d and or tabletop role-playing games in general. Um, and people see it as a game. Or it's like, what is it? Is it, is it like a board game? Is it, they don't quite understand how it works. Um, and so it's a matter of, of, one, talking to them about what it is. And that I usually I just say it's make-believe for adults. It's you have a novel. When you're reading a novel, you're reading about these characters and you can put yourself into those stories, kind of, or a video game or a movie. But role, tabletop role-playing games go beyond that and you become the characters. You are in the novel. You are in the the movie. And... And what happens in those kind of situations when you put yourselves into these stories and you go through these epic adventures or, you know, whatever, what have you, and you're forging these bonds with as characters with other people, it's more than just um, doing a dungeon crawl or anything like that. You experience these moments with these people and you can actually learn confidence through these role-playing games you can learn like you can build a character that's very confident and then you can step into those shoes and have that safe area to explore these ideas and these moments um say i refer to it as a movie where you are the actor actresses but you are making up the lines as you go absolutely yeah um and it's great to be able to step into that space um and i know a lot of people aren't comfortable with role playing straight away and that's fine because there's different ways of role playing. You don't have to step in and be the most amazing actor or actress to be able to do these things. That's that's one of the wonderful things about role playing games is that you can create those characters. You can default to the dice and the mechanics of the game to be able to accomplish these things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Um, I've made characters that are far smarter than I am. <laughs> I've made characters that are a lot more brash and... Um, forthright with what they believe than than I am like I get to be that angry person that I don't feel like I necessarily can be and so it's it's teaching these games are, are a way to be able to learn how to um experience these things that you feel if you feel restricted in, in your day-to-day -day life and I know there's people you know I, I had a, we've had a whole conversation in our discord server about um about these things, about how we end up as people just naturally creating characters that are a little bit about our, like ourselves, or if not, characters that have traits and, and personality, you know, personality traits that we wish we had. Um, like I, I always felt like it was a bit hard to be angry, like I was taught by no fault of anyone that I grew up around, but I inherently learned that I was not allowed to be um, an angry person. I wasn't allowed to be upset or mad. Those were feelings that I wasn't allowed to have. I was the happy one. I was the the, the ray of sunshine in my household. Um, and so I think I end up recent, like recently, I've just been making characters the past few years that uh, are a bit angrier. Um, a bit bitchier <laughs> but also characters that learn how to be in those spaces and learn how to move past that essentially to work out these feelings um and i know that there's people when i made wayfarer's league and when i've made my 
my I was in God Alming when I first moved to God Alming I made God Alming gaming uh, through Meetup to meet people and to have my table again because I suddenly was without any games and I, I need my games. <laughs> um, but I think doing these things and bringing these people together and affording this space for people to meet others and to have that social connection. And a lot of times these games also draw people who are a bit um, more introverted or, um, you know, anxious about social, social spheres and what have you. And so I think one of the reasons that we've wanted to make Wayfarers League is to give that space to those people to connect with each other and to, to experience these games to find, you know, this creative freedom that you um, may not be able to find in other avenues of life. Yeah. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in. Um, I can never really tell how many viewers I actually have. One of the things, so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, and it's really the power of story. Um, I have my tea. Very important. I think as a GM, I'm recently learning more and more about um, challenging my players and that, that it being okay. Because I've, I've always been a bit of a chicken. Not that any of the players that have been in, in any of my games would believe that, <laughs> but I've been a bit of a chicken in terms of wanting to challenge them. And I think that's actually, it's a shame because in, you know, in games, the most perilous moments, the most um, amazing times is when you are challenged as a player and when you overcome that challenge. Uh, so bringing in those monsters and having the very challenging fights um, where you're at, you know, the, the edge of your limits as a player when you're down to two more spell slots and it doesn't seem like anything is going to happen and then there's that turn in the battle. Um, those are moments that you remember. One of the best role-playing moments in any game I've ever played it was when the DM somewhat unfairly sentenced the PS to PC to death. Yeah. Like, we... I was, I'm running this um, series of games, I say series, it's, it's, it ended up being a mini campaign a bit on accident, not entirely, I knew it was going to be longer, um, but I, I've taken this group of uh, drow in the Underdark to, to a, a city and it ended up being infested with mind flayers. Um, and I was struggling with trying to figure out how to build the final battle without making it too difficult, but still wanting it to be a challenge. And we played Friday night. We didn't finish the fight. We, it was just combat the whole time, which I, I don't fully enjoy. But this, um, it's, yeah, it's always a bit tricky with D&D combat. Um, and I imagine it was very frustrating for them because they kept getting stunned. <laughs> Some of them especially. But it was the first time that I really... In a long time. I mean, it's, it's been ages since it, um, I've managed a fight that I designed entirely that um, really... It challenged the players, but I feel like that they could make it out of it. They're still... It's still quite perilous at this moment. Um... Yeah, but it's it's quite it's satisfying to be able to do that, um, and I'm hoping to do that more with my group from because I was running Waterdeep before, and I feel like every encounter in that book is either way too easy or way too hard. It's not balanced very well. One of the best moments I had was being down to one PC versus a mage that was preparing to take him down with a magic missile on his turn. They were both on their last legs, and he had to hit to save the day. That sounds intense. One of the best moments I had as a GM was when a player had died. Um, 
I'll tell that in just a minute. He absolutely did the crime, stole a sacred text, but we weren't expecting an execution. All right. I ended up having to support the execution to prevent violence between the party and the NPCs. That sounds really intense. Um, wow. I, what was I saying? Um, oh, one of the best moments I have had as a GM and what the players, I think one of the most intense moments was when a player died, he had his life sucked out by a ghoul. I think it was, um, not a ghoul. Anyway, he had his life sucked out. He died instantly, which threw all the players. They're like, what? And the player just got up and walked out of the room for a little bit. I think he was obviously a bit upset about what happened. But the players had a scroll of resurrection. And they were quite low level. They weren't high enough to cast it. And so they had to roll to see even if they could cast it. And so after the fight was finished, they set up the space, an hour ritual, right, all of that. And so I had them roll to even cast it, and it succeeded. And then they did. I like the the way that Matt Mercer does his um, resurrection uh, resurrection rituals where three players bring, bring offerings to try to uh, entice the soul back. And that adjusts the, the DC. And so we did that. Everyone rolled... There are various things. There's, there's like, you know, four separate roles before the final one to see if they get even get resurrected. resurrected. And when they had me roll the final one because I think they were all too freaked out. But that moment when it was like I rolled on the table in front of everybody so then everyone could see it. And when it came up as a success, the entire table just like cheered like crazy. Um, that was great. And that, that was a large group, too. There was about seven players in that in that game. And so it's eight of us around the table, and it was amazing. I don't think I'll ever forget that. Um, yeah, you can have these amazing moments, and I think, you know, you get really invested in these these stories and the characters. And one of the ways that you can get those moments is really, is as a player, invest your time in the other characters. You're not just there just with your sheet of paper and and your character you are there as a as part of a group and if you take an interest in other characters and their backstories and and what they're good at and then pay attention to what's happening in combat and if that you know one of the characters saves yours you can have a conversation about that after the fight and acknowledge what has happened as characters and then you build that relationship and you can bring in little flavor things like little role play moments um you can like in one in one of the games I was in, the I was playing an elderly Tabaxi. She's um she's a druid, and she her mentor as a druid was I, I liked one of the options in the book is um this uh, figure in your dreams, and so I was like oh that sounds cool I don't know who this is but you know they they've been teaching me since I was a child in my dreams, and the GM decided you know he asked if. He asked permission first, but it, um, if my character's father could have been absent while she was growing up. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. And it ended up, he decided to present this figure. Um, my mentor ended up being my father. And so we had um, this time where she met him. And then they started to build this relationship together because he was quite old and he was dying. And so he was, um, he didn't honor his own druidic path and so he was his life was failing at that point um and we had a few really nice like he set up this whole role play scene there was no real encounter there was no skill checks or anything but he had the father they teleported somewhere and he created a sunset using um uh create weather i believe like one of those spells he he designed a sunset for for oak it was really sweet and then so then i came back and designed a scene essentially where i i had oak take him to this very special location that she found very sacred 
for a sunrise. And so she gifted him a sunrise and then made, using stone shape, really like a simple little cantrip, created a little coin with um, a picture of an oak tree on one side and a moose on the other. Moose was for him. And so it's like, we're the same, we're essentially the same, but different sides of the coin. Like, we're the same, but different. Um, and so like a little memento for him. So these are, that's the one thing that people, you can take advantage in your games is creating these nice little scenes for for yourself and for other players and for the GM. And so that's the power of these games is that you are, you are the writers. You're the creators of this space. It's more than just a dungeon crawl and loot, um, or it can be, if that's what you would like to have in your games. Like you see these, and you, I think that's the thing is like, it can be just to get together with some buddies and, and have a laugh and, you know, um, murder hobooing and fart jokes and things. But you also have this opportunity to create these moments together. Um, as a GM, I like to also just drop things in front of my players that I think that I know that their, their characters will respond to. For instance, the game I was talking about where that character had died, that same group, one of the, um, one of the characters had this thing for elves, um, and, and so in the space that they were wandering around, it's quite unlikely that they were going to run into one, but I created these NPCs that were lost in the, they were in the Underdark, and so these NPCs, um, wandering the Underdark, it was a brother and sister elves, and the player... The way he played his character was so funny because he was so awkward. He was trying to flirt, trying to make a move, and just was really, really bad. And there was so much laughter just from just from dropping in this NPC that I knew his character would respond to. And you can do similar things like if you if you have a druid that knows how to speak with animals, you can have um, creatures around. Or if they're everybody likes a pet, you can have you know a little pet salesman or um, or even magic items like I there's this one magic item I really like called bag of kittens um, and it can be quite questionable depending on your players so know your nor, know your group before you do things like that um, but essentially it's a it's a bag where once a day you can bring out 1d6 kittens and they last for one hour and then they disappear. If you put them back in the bag, they'll disappear. They have one hit point, and if you cuddle them during a short rest, you get advantage on your hit die. That's it. And um, it was fun because I gave them to that group and one of the characters absolutely fell in love with the kittens and they disappeared and got really upset. <laughs> Not the player, the character got really upset. Uh, having a kitten disappear. <laughs> It's quite fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what I, one of the things that I do recommend is to get invested in each other's stories. I don't know if this is a question, but I've been trying to run a more political game with factions and things, but my players aren't into it. I'm so sad. Oh, that's too bad. Um. You can bring your story to Wayfarers League. I know a few people that would be keen to play that kind of game. I, I had a similar thing happen where I was in a group and our whole group was in a city and everyone was bored except for me. <laughs> it's like I could hang out in this city forever and just get up to all sorts of shenanigans because my character was quite manipulative and, and she had um, she was part of a crime organization in that city and so there was a lot of different things that we got up to but I think everyone else just wanted to leave. And we did, which was fine. I, I, I'm not going to make everybody stay in the area that I want to be in. That's not fun. Um, cause I can have fun really wherever our group went and I did. Um, political games are with factions. Yeah. You need, you need the right group for that. Some people just want to go exploring dungeons and doing various little quests and things. Um, 
I think Fallets wanted to Fallets wanted to do um, a political game at some point as well. I'm quite I'm quite keen to try something like that. I think it would be fun. You have to have the right kind of character for it, though. I've never run anything like that, though. I don't know if I could run it. I don't. I'm not really politically minded. Um, that said, I do have. We Katie and I are working on a very big campaign using Onua, which is the Wayfarers League official, uh, our own homebrew world. And there is some political stuff in the background going with that. I know you are working on a homebrew as a continuation, but how would you go about creating a homebrew with all new players? Would you have a session zero to get an idea of what the players are looking for? Yes. I would, first and foremost, um, if I was building First, if I was building a homebrew story, I would figure out what I want to run because I need to be excited about it. And so I'd come up with a bare bones kind of similar to actually what I'm doing in behind the uh, behind the GM screen, where I I come up with a base plot, an idea, any kind of villains that I would want to to have. Um, I would actually I'm doing that a bit. I can talk a bit about because I'm I have a fate game that I really want to run. Um, then I ran Dragon Heist. Oh, that's too bad, Bobagus. Honestly, if you want to run, like, a political game, we've got lots of people that want to do it. Blades in the Dark is so much fun. I absolutely love the Blades game that we're in. All the different factions and pitting people against each other and... Yeah. Granted, my character's not really doing that. She's more of a ghosty person. Anyway, um, so what I did for for Fate, I had a concept that got me very excited being post-apocalyptic Disneyland. I thought it was amazing. I've been to D Disneyland countless times growing up in California, and so I know the land, I know the areas, and I knew how I wanted to change it. I had ideas of how to change it. And so I presented this idea to my to the player group, saying who wanted to play. And so I had a handful of people. I also invited specific people to this game. Not that we've played it. That was two years ago. Um, and so I started with an idea. And then I got my players. And then they started to bring their character concepts. And I took those character concepts and adding it to the world. And which helped inform it. And so that was very much co-creation. Um, I think with with the campaign that Katie and I are writing, we don't have any players at the moment. And so we are coming up with the plot, the um, the maps, the, the story, specific story points that we want to do. It's probably a bit more railroady, but there's, obs there's lots of choices within it to branch off to do specific stuff. Um, but if I want to make sure, so if I'm doing something that structured, I want to make sure that I have players that are actually interested in playing it. So I would definitely have a session zero saying, this is the things that I want to do. These are the game that I want to run. And then if people are interested at that point, they can bow out and just like, this isn't the game for me. I'm like, okay, cool. Then you find new players that would be much more interested in the game that you want to run. Because at the, at the end of the day, it is a game and we need to be having fun playing it. Everyone, including the GM. We we are also a player. It's not just about the players and what they want. We need to have fun doing it as well. Um, when I was running Dragon Heist, I didn't really have a lot of fun in the end running that tor towards the end. And so I started trying to add things to it so it was fun for me. And so I ended up bringing in a little cute little kobold uh, servant named Tuk Tuk who they adopted and has essentially become uh, one of the players. Um, oh, what's his name? Like Dobby. <laughs> A bit. Just without the magic. Um, I'll probably talk about Tech Tech during one of the GM, behind the GM screen. She's going to become a bigger part, I think, at some point. Um, yeah, that's... If you have a set group of players that you want to continue to play with and they're not keen on whatever it is that you're running, 
um, you just find another game. You can do a series of one shots too to see what everyone's keen on. It's all a bit different, isn't it? But yeah, the one of the things that I actually really liked. I did a we did a session zero with Rob uh, ages ago. We did a small um, dungeon. Was it Dungeon World? Dragon World. Um, it was the Powered by the Apocalypse D and D light game. Uh, and but what we did for that session zero was we we all decided what kind of characters we wanted to play. And then Rob said, "Whatever race you pick, you are in charge of the lore of the war of that race in your in the world." So, I was an elf. I'd never played an elf before, and so I decided that the elves uh, were essentially the bureaucrats of the world. And because of how old they, how old they, how long they live for, um, they really don't. They drag their heels on everything and so everyone hates the elves because they don't get anything done it's like the entire world is run by the dmv if you have any experience with the dmv in, in the states um but my my elf was very much against that and really upset with her race and that she was she was an activist essentially very outspoken and full of idealism and um and she was a wizard and she learned by a correspondence course <laughs> She was really fun to play. <laughs> she liked to talk, talk a lot. And so it was really cool because then we also said what we wanted in a game and what we didn't want in the game. And we were all pretty tired at that point and pretty, we, we were tired of really grim, um, dire situations. And so we, we wanted a lot of hope in the game. And so we called, and, and so we called it Hope Punk. Because we were bringing hope to a hopeless world. That was, a, that was a really short game, but it was a fun game. And um, I think that's really powerful to do in, in, at your own tables. And things that you can do, even if you're running a game for a long time, like there's a lot of run, long-running campaigns, you can have a Session Zero mid-campaign to check in with your players to see if there's things people like, what they don't like, the direction that you want to go. And that's really important to keep the... Um, to keep the momentum of your campaign and also make check in with your GM make sure that they're okay because GM burnout is really it's big and if it's a slog to be running it it's just gonna die at some point it's hard uh, noble dark <laughs> yeah um, if you're just tuning in you can uh, drop in a note drop in a question a statement tell me how your game's going I love hearing pe about people's games. It's like, I, I feel like whenever I try talking about my game to people, uh, they get this look, this glazed look, because, you know, it's fantasy land kind of stuff. I just, I will love hearing everyone's stories. Uh, we have a channel in the Discord, in the Discord server called Tales from the Table. It's one of my favorites. Um, let's see, you have Grim Dark and Noble Bright, but if you have a terrible world with good people, you have Noble Dark. Yeah, well, the the world itself that we made wasn't necessarily terrible. It had a, it was essentially split by a mountain, and one side was completely desolate of life, and it was it was bad, um, and the rest of the world was over here. But no one was doing anything about that horrible area of the world, and so we really wanted to go do something about it. So it was we called it Hope Punk. <laughs> I like Noble Dark though; that's fun. Um, I like Grim Dark too. How many plot hooks do you like to come up with at the beginning of your homebrew that your players may come across? Honestly, I I have not developed a massive amount of plot hooks when I've made things. I essentially have one storyline in the beginning. I have one thing that says, this is the thing you should be doing. Um, and they'll generally go for it. I will probably come up with more for, for the behind the dream screen game that I'm developing. Um, because I, I want to add in little side quests and so I guess it depends on what you want to develop as a GM if you want to have a lot of little side quests or you want your main plot things will also just pop up naturally I think um, as you come up with NPCs your NPCs can have little quests that your players can go on 
most of the things that I've run have been fairly straightforward. Um, so not much. I think I'm going to continue I continue this um, fate game that I started because I did a one shot with my because I'm learning fate and I've only run it once and it, the players everyone seemed to really enjoy it and I'm still learning it and so I'm doing little one shots to learn the system before I run my Disneyland ridiculousness. <laughs> um, that's going to be a bit longer. But, I mean, so I essentially, for those, they're just one shots. And so when you develop a one shot, you, you have your players, there's this kind of social agreement that the players are going to go for what you're offering them. You have, as a player, you kind of need to make that, that choice. Um, because you're there to play a game, you're there to do the story that the GM is offering you. And so, as a GM, I don't typically come up with a whole lot of plot hooks because I have the story that I'd like them to do. And if they don't go that way, I'll just start making up stuff for what they do end up doing. Um, I guess some things also just kind of happen because in, in the Waterdeep game that I did, the players did a um, the drinking the drinking mini game that I have up on Wayfarers League on a shop. You can download it. It's one pound because um, I couldn't make it 50p. <laughs> Um, and so they did this, this drinking game where they blacked out and they ended up, one of the guys woke up in a little B&B, &B, uh, with none of his stuff. Nothing. Everything was stolen off of him. So that became a mini side quest to try to find his stuff, which I kind of wove back into the main plot line. Uh, so I had him, I had a, a member of, you know, one faction take advantage of them and so they ended up fighting them at some point but he never got his stuff back because he didn't look for it when he went into their hideout it was there they just didn't look for it um yeah i guess that's that's pretty much it coming up with little little offshoots i had things set up like i, I had a job board that the players could have gone and looked at and gone monster hunting or you know, went and did this job for these other people. I had stuff available, but they just never went and did it. So I guess that's some stuff. Those are little plot hooks. I think I forget about them because they end up not getting done. <laughs> I just remember the main story. Um, yeah, I mean, as a GM, you don't need to come up with a million things to run your game. It's not really needed. Yeah, it's, yes, every story is very linear. <laughs> I like things that connect together, and so I like also the repeating NPCs, people you see again, so I'll probably bring back some some of these NPCs the guys have met along the way. Um, it just makes the world richer. It makes the story deeper when you can create these relationships with these fictional characters quite fun. I had a thought and then it fell out of my brain. Let's see, I think that is what makes Matthew Mercer good. He weaves his players' backstories into a lot of his stories. Yeah, I think that's, I think that is a really important skill to learn how to do is to weave your characters into it. So when, as a player, what you can do is when you create your backstory, create NPCs in your backstory for your GM to use. Um, Create holes in it where you you don't fill in the the details. Work with your GM to about you know what you can be involved with. When I when I started um, that game, when I was talking about the city. When we started that game, it was a homebrew world that Scott came up with, and um, I I wanted to play this bard that I had come up with uh, earlier in the year. Um, I wanted to make a College of Whispers bard where she was very manipulative and she's. Um, essentially criminal that, um, that was a face, essentially, right? She played music, but she also gathered information. She was a spy of sorts. And he had a, a criminal organization called the Talon in his world already, 
But then we came up, like, I came up with another one just to add more to the world, more factions. And it was called The Wooden Coin. And so she became a member, a, a very active member in The Wooden Coin and how she, she grew into it. And so I off, you know, I, that, that backstory that we're giving, like, we did a job together and I did a job with another player because we connected our backstories and how that went down. And so that right there gave Scott four NPCs for the background. Plus, um, I was on the run, and there's this um, this faction that is now available, and my mentor came, like, I ended up meeting my mentor, and how that went down. Like, one of the NPCs from my backstory ended up joining us for a long time, um, and my character ended up killing him. Like, it was really, it was heavy. It was fun. My poor character, I mean, that's Larissa. She's, uh, she had a hard time. Um... She started having a good time and the game ended. <laughs> That's fine. Jam burnout, he needs a break. That's cool. And maybe we'll get back to it at some point. Maybe we won't. Um, I'll still have that character and maybe I'll use her somewhere else. But I think what I think what I take away from that is that he was very good at taking those characters and bringing them into the story and being an active part of it. And that that makes your character that makes your players' characters part of the world and invested in the story. They're more invested if you can weave them into the world. Um, and that just makes it better for, as a as a whole, just a better, um, a better experience. It's fun. It's hard. Especially if you're not used to it. But just, just go for it, I think. That's, that's just what you gotta do. It's a game, it's fun. There's no real pressure I feel like a lot of the pressure comes just on ourselves and making sure that we, we want it to be fun we care about it to being fun um, and that does make things a bit harder but in, I think as long as your players your players are there to support you as well um, and hopefully work with you um, we're coming up to the end of the hour about 15 minutes out. I think I started a bit late. So welcome. you're welcome to drop more uh, questions on there. I just want to cover a few different things. Um, yeah, at the beginning, definitely. I'm trying to think of other games that I've been in. I like trying to connect my character to the other characters in some fashion. I like co connections between characters like siblings or old friends or um like when they have a history it's fun um so next weekend um next weekend that we have another james chat on sunday we've got um behind the jam screen in the morning on sunday where sam and i will continue to talk about stuff uh and we also have uh, I believe we are going to be back on Friday with Everchosen. This Tuesday, uh, Fellas is going to be on on Twitch to to play a video game. I don't remember which one it is. You can ask him in Discord. <laughs> and you're more than welcome to come join us uh, on our Discord server. You can find all the information on wayfarersleague.com. Uh, including our shop with merchandise. You can get yourself uh, a water bottle. I'm wearing my shirt today, which I quite like. <laughs> my kids all have their various shirts, which is fun. I had a shirt with flourish on it and I loved it and then it vanished. I don't know where it went and it makes me really sad and I hope I find it soon. I miss it. Okay, but so many adventures are designed to have your character not be related to the adventure at all. Dragon Heist, Curse of Strahd, Tomb of Annihilation. It's true. I think the thing, it's designed that way because they can't really include them. The one thing that um, all of those books generally have a section in the back called where you can create a bond. And I know Dragon Heist has a collection of NPCs that you can your, your character can know those characters, those various NPCs, and so that's an in for various things. Um, same thing like the Horde of the Dragon Queen. I ran that when it first came out. No, it didn't finish it because that game kind of exploded, but um, it had bonds in the begin at the back of the book. I think one of them was like giving your character visions of horrible things. And um, 
I think the thing about D&D is not necessarily being a stranger, but being fresh face kind of adventurer, going out and exploring and discovering all these things for the first time, if you're starting at level one. Um, and as a GM, you can take, you can take your players and, and bring them into the world anyway. I know Phileas is running um, Horde, Horde of the Dragon Queen and that Tyranny of Dragons, the whole arc. And one of the players wanted to be a noble, um, noble birth and went for Never Ember, who happens to be, you know, the, the lord of, um, I can't remember the name of the city, one of the main cities in that, in that campaign. And he's like, yeah, sure. And so then that's an end into the world. She's well known, likely, um, but that's fun for them. I don't mind being a stranger in, in the worlds. This is just a different way of playing. It wasn't Waterdeep. I think she had a home in Waterdeep, but it wasn't. Uh, Neverwinter. Yeah, that's the one. Because um, I think he was he wasn't the open lord at that point in the story. He'd gone up to Never to Neverwinter. Um But I think I'm making sure that I didn't I didn't miss any questions somewhere else. Okay. Um, I think that's where I'm gonna call it tonight because I've got something else in the next fifteen minutes or so. But um. Thanks guys for joining me today. Just just little old me. And come check out wayfarersleague.com and all the different information. We have a ton of different games. We have more that I'm going to be listing tomorrow. Um, and come and adventure with us. And we'll see you guys next time.